Kaziotko. So hi, everyone. I'm Lucas Cernesak, um, uh, plant scientist here at JCU. And it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers today. Um, of course, Professor Susan Lawrence doesn't need an introduction. Everyone knows her very well. But, um, but she has a very long history of working in tropical forest restoration in the Australian wet tropics. So she started um, mm. doing her masters here and worked on corridors um, on the tableland and then went for several years to the Amazon where she did her PhD um, and followed by several years at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama and then um, has come back and now continues to work on, on tropical forest restoration. Susan was uh, an ARC future fellow, also um, former president of the tropical of the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation, and of course she's published many papers and is um, very well respected. <coughs> Welcome, Susan. And then also speaking with Susan is Colleen Middleby, who's a PhD student here at JCU, studying with me, and also Darren Crane and Martin Breed. And Kali did her undergraduate degree in Göttingen in Germany. And she studied um, leaf, the, the relationship between leaf temperatures and air temperatures. And she's now brought that into her PhD work. And she'll talk a little bit about that um, as well. So welcome and Thank look you. forward to the talk. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land that we are, the um, Jabagai, Kumai Idinji and Iriganji people and just acknowledge their community leaders past, present and future. Um, so restoration priorities for adapting for um, research priorities for adapting forest restoration to future climate change. So the um, treat has the trees for the Evelyn and Atherton tableland have a adage that we need to have put the right tree in the right place for the right reason. And that's been the, the premise of their work for, for a very long history. And it's been almost 40 years since that rainforest restoration started on the tablelands. And it really benefited from the fact that there was very early rainforest ecology research that was being done at that time. And they were able to contribute to how we should be restoring rainforests. And I think it gives us an opportunity, that long history really gives us an opportunity to examine and adjust, if necessary, how we might do restoration in the future. So succession is a really important part of restoration. And it, the succession describes the process of how communities assemble. And we think about succession, um, this beautiful illustration here illustrates how Forests may succession may drive forest community changes from very early stages of woody plant arrival up to a climax stage. And so the assumption with restoration is that we will be able to kickstart the community and through time it will self assemble with new species arriving and old species dying and early species dying into a climax composition. And we like to think about when we actually collect the data and study community assembly, it looks more like this graph on the bottom with time and with abundance on the y-axis. And we look at the different types of plants that are arriving over time and how their abundances may increase and then decline with this idea that there will be a trajectory, there will be a rate of change that we can measure at which point we can assess how that community composition is converging towards a mature forest or a climax system. And these trajectories, these rates of change are gonna be influenced, we know that they're influenced by things such as environmental factors and the bi and biotic interactions such as species traits and this idea of niche partitioning, that there are niches for particular species. So we've studied trajectories uh, in natural forest recovery, and we've done this on the tablelands through a chronic sequence of secondary forest ages, which went from three years to 67 years. And so we had um, 33 sites of secondary forest. We had eight sites of mature forest and eight pasture sites. So across 59 sites, 
we studied, we identified all the trees and seedlings along 50 metre transects. And we can assess the trajectories from this data. So here I've got a graph of forest age on the x-axis and on the y-axis, I'm using a measure of forest structure called basal area. And what, when we look at 30 year, 30 year um, age of forests, we can find two points that um, may be varying by 100% in structural size, but overall those sites, we see a very clear trajectory in how those sites are growing. So essentially, not surprisingly, as trees grow, they get bigger <laughs> and all sites that have got trees growing on them do get bigger with time. So that trajectory is a really clear trajectory. And if we compare it with some work that Lawrence Porter did in, in neotropical forests, when he's looking, he's here looking at forest structure using an estimate of above ground biomass of forest sites that are 20 years of age, we find that again, there's a lot of trees, a lot of sites are accumulating biomass at that point, except for sites which are really showing a deficit in water. So soil water availability is really important to how fast and how big tree, how fast um, forests grow. So the trend is clear here, except when sites lack water. But what does that mean? But the, what's more important for us is trying to understand how the community composition is changing. Or how are we developing the species which are going to move towards a mature forest? And so here I've got a graph from our data where we've got forest age again on the x-axis and on the y-axis, I have a metric of diversity called Fisher's alpha diversity. And that's a really nice metric which combines both abundance and the number of species that you get at a site. And so here we find actually very a great, we find more variation in the types of trajectories. So forests of the same, which we think are the same age, are not accumulating species at the same rate. So we see a greater variation in trajectories. Um, and there was another study that Luke Shu led where they, from, also from the Tablelands, where they were kept comparing tree plantings with natural regrowth. And they also found, and while they found that tree plantings were able to give a bit of more of a kickstart in terms of um, floristic diversity, adding by adding more mature phase species, there was still um, a disparity between where they were and where mature forest is. So tree plantings are faster, but we are still not seeing a convergence in the trajectories. And there's been quite a lot of work about how species assemble in rainforests. And we know that even if we've got these right, the good environmental conditions, there are stochastic processes which influence a species arrival into a community. And so this can be whether it's, um, you have a limitation in disperses, you have a limitation in seed availability, vacant niches, and just a varying environmental conditions but these characteristics are very random and we think that they are really important in limiting convergence of forest communities. And climate warming and extreme weather events increases that randomness, so that environmental stochasticity. So I'll just talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of climate warming and extreme events. So this figure, this very, this is what the climate looked like on the planet on Monday this week. <laughs> and it's very alarming. And it's basically showing that we're in the Northern Hemisphere summer is the, is one of the hottest, is the hottest time of the year for our planet. And we've got some very hot places in the Northern, in Northern Hemisphere this year. And it's looking like 2023 is going to be an exceptional year. Last month, we had the hottest day on record, and our expectation is that this will be the hottest year on record. In Cairns, we've been actually experiencing some really not quite mild, quite a nice, but wet winter. Um, but that's not the case for other Southern Hemisphere countries, which should be in the winter. So both in Africa and South America, they've also been experiencing some really abnormal 
high temperatures in Santiago, for example, just a week ago, had a 37 degree day at 1500 metres up the Andes. <laughs> so that was very alarming for them because it's winter and it's very high elevation and very unexpected. So climate change, of course, we know it's increasing the intensity, frequency and duration of droughts and heat waves. Um, and that droughts result both from low soil moisture due to a lack of rainfall or precipitation deficits, but that also and or can be driven by atmospheric aridity. Tropical rainforests, of course, don't experience droughts very frequently because they wouldn't be tropical rainforests if they did. But where we have seen tropical rainforests experience droughts, they've been seasonal and generally associated with El Nino patterns. But warming is really increasing the vulnerability of rainforests to future drought. And I'll just draw your attention to a figure here in the bottom. And so this is an estimate. This is a long-term um, estimation of soil moisture in the canopies of the largest areas of rainforest in the world. And essentially over time, we're seeing a, general, a strong declining pattern which is independent of when El Nino's were associated with these forests. So essentially canopy, rainforest canopies now are holding much less moisture in the, and as a result with future droughts, they may be more vulnerable. Um, a, a recent, I guess over the last five years, people have been publishing papers on flash droughts. And, but we think flash droughts have probably occurred over decades but it's only now that we're really appreciating what they are. So a flash drought is really characterized by a very rapid onset um, of drying conditions, likely being driven by atmospheric aridity. And it causes plants to rapidly lose water through evapotranspiration and for, from soil moisture and, and for soil moisture to decline suddenly and significantly. So it, you, we would observe it as a sudden wilt and certainly I think I've observed this in Cairns myself because I live in the rainforest and I, in 2019, I remember the whole forest wilting despite the fact that I felt there was adequate soil moisture because it had been raining a few days earlier. So I, I, do, I am really interested in this process and its importance for where we are. It is seen as a more common phenomena in the tropics and when they've modelled flash droughts throughout the world, Northern Australia comes up as a potential hotspot for flash droughts. And that modelling was done pre-2015 for this figure here, which is showing Northern Australia as a hotspot. But in more recent work, people have said that the droughts that we've seen in 2018 are very likely to have been very similar to this, to a flash drought. Um, so it's yeah, so it's a phenomenon of the tropics and it's more likely to occur in the summer months. So actually in our wet season months of November, December, January, February, where we get our hottest weather. So now heat waves. <laughs> and um, so heat waves are, by, are described as period, prolonged periods of excessive hot days where temperature gets above 35 degrees Celsius and nights increase in warmth. The best predictor of a heat wave or of heat wave conditions is an increase in the number of hot days, of excessive hot days. And so I have this figure here that um, Camilla loaned me that she's prepared for one of her papers. And we have on the, on the x-axis, I've got the last eight decades where we've got temperature, good temperature records for Cairns. And on the y-axis, we've got the number of hot days above 35 degrees. And so in our first decade of when data was recorded, there was 17 days and our most recent decade has 67. So we're reaching the point where we're getting as many hot days per year as what we used to get per decade in prior time in the past. It's very uncommon in the tropics for us to get heat waves because heat waves generally are, being, are driven by aridity. So as an area dries out, it generally gets hotter. And as it gets hotter, it loses more soil moisture and it dries out. So we have a cycle of heat and drying 
which, is, which generally starts off with aridity. Um, what happens in the tropics is because we have these quite moisture laden winds, we're able to disrupt that cycle. And so it's very uncommon for us to get heat waves, except we did. <laughs> in November, 2018, you'll recall, we had six days that were above 35 degrees Celsius with including three days that were four, above 41 degrees, which was almost 12 degrees above the monthly average, the November average. And it was also associated with very low humidity and high wildfire risk. So how can tree planting and restoration adapt to climate change in the coming decades? So I think it has a lot to do with our expectations. So we need to, re we need to really consider our expectations for restoration. In the past, we would think about a site being returned. We, we would want to restore a site with the idea that it's going to return to some pre-disturbance state, and that succession will converge towards that community, succession will converge the community towards a climax community. But now with climate warming and extreme weather events, increasing environmental stochicity, stochasticity, it's going to result in very in far fewer sites being having that capacity to converge back. So we're not going to see succession following that pattern for as many sites. So we need to define what would be realistic and, and desirable alternatives. And how can we adapt and improve our metrics of what success is in rainforest restoration? So I've outlined here six smart strategies for restoring forests to how, or how we would develop climate smart strategies for developing forests, for, for restoring forests. And, in green, Carly is going to speak after me on the topic of provenance selection. So I thought I'd start off with just one idea about species selection to address, hot, to address drought and high temperatures. And that is that um, extensive and deeper root growth is really a key for drought resilience with plants. But we have a trade-off with restoration in that People focus on, oh, sorry, we have a trade-off with restoration that people focusing very much on fast growth, but fast growth is, does not come with large areas of root biomass. So we either, if we focus on root biomass, then we need plants to be growing slower. If we're looking at fast growth, we're looking for plants who are gonna grow taller, but they're not going to invest in the low ground root biomass. And this becomes a real issue with carbon offsetting and carbon planting because the focus now is so much on fast, large species. We will, and, but I believe that the focus purely in this space could really, in, you could be increasing your planting to become, you, the, the planting could essentially become more drought vulnerable. Because as I said, slow growing <coughs> plants have more extensive and deeper rooting systems and have better drought adaptations. We have 52 key species that Jaden, <laughs> Jaden Engert has identified that of with the, which make up more than a half of all the nursery stock. And it would make sense now for us to have a better understanding of how is biomass allocated between root to shoot for these 52 species, which make up so much of our tree plantings in this region. And then the second question, is carbon farming more vulnerable to drought because of its selection of tree species? So our next topic is soil health and drought adaptation. So it's really important, of, it's gonna be very important to improve soil health in supporting root growth and plant survival. And we need to have a clear idea of how soil health differs across our planting sites. And how can we increase organic matter and soil water holding capacity, reduce compaction to promote water movement, increase root growth and exploration of roots into deeper soil layers, which is going to give plants access to water when we're having low you know, drought events. And then of course, how do these 52 key plant species, 52 species which make up so much of tree planting, how do they grow differently in different soil types? So I've got some data here from 
um, our, um, from two studies that I've been part of, where we have 72 sites across the tablelands where we've looked at soil variability. And these sites cover the east, west, and north, south aspects. And 32 of these sites are in pasture. So if, we, if I make a comparison between soil properties, between pasture, early secondary forest, late secondary forest, and mature forest, we find that um, basically our abandoned grasslands current um, have a significantly higher clay content. Now, it could be that the grasses are more competitive and better on clays than excluding secondary forest recovery, or it could be just the nature of our sampling just happened to, or you know, we just happen to have picked up more clay areas with grasslands, or that grasslands were maintained more clearing to avoid <coughs> secondary forest recovery. But if the invasive species and plant species are more competitive, I think that's going to be a very important future question. pH on average was also significantly higher in our pastures. Oh, sorry, well, was more alkaline. But we, I've used a violin plot here just to demonstrate that there was a spread across those different pasture sites. If I compare, interestingly, if we compare looking at available phosphorus, we find a reverse pattern where our forested sites with mature rainforest having significantly higher available phosphorus um, compared to the grassland sites, or grassland sites being significantly lower than all of the forested sites. And then when it came to total nitrogen, we don't see any distinctive pattern. Um, well, I did want to mention here, but this, so this pattern of higher, more available phosphorus in our forested sites compared to pastures, it could be due to the clay soils, but it also could do, be due to the presence of mycorrhiza associations. So that gets us onto mycorrhiza. So a vascular mycorrhiza fungi um, improve plant tolerance to drought and heat stress. So we know that these fungi colonize plant roots and they provide nutrients and water and can alleviate drought stress by increasing plant available water. Um, in a recent study published this year in Science, tree seedlings inoculated with AMF communities sourced from drier and warmer sites displayed higher survival when faced with drought and heat stress. So, that raises some really interesting questions for the future for restoration here. Um, can we describe our, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi communities, how they vary between wet and dry sites in the wet tropics? If we inoculate seedlings with AF communities from dry sites, will it make them more heat and drought tolerant? And then, of course, the big question that everyone always wants to know, what is the residual effect of Roundup? glyphosate on AM community establishment and does that vary with time? So is there a residual effect? And so here I'm presenting some data that we have on um, fungal communities, AM fungal communities and natural forest recovery. And it's from these sites um, near Tarzali. And essentially what I've done with the fungal communities here, I've run an ordination analysis of 22 sites and of a community that has 123 different virtual taxa from 110 soil samples. And this ordination, it's not great for, for me, but 34% was still explaining something. And let me tell you what we think characterizes how communities change. So if we have, again, we have forest age here on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we have the ordination axis. So whether it's high or low doesn't actually reflect high or low numbers of fungal communities. What it reflects is the differences. So uh, between the communities, between the sites. So um, value of, so communities up here, are just very different from communities down here in terms of their species and their abundances, but they're not, there's no value, we're not adding a value to that in terms of one being better or worse. 
So if we compare the different types of forests that we have, our recovering forests, we find that mature forests have very different fungal communities compared to regrowing forests, and that early and mid differ from our late successional forests. Tree diversity provides some prediction, some we get some correlation with the AMF community. It's not hugely high, but it's still recommend, it's still demonstrating that there is some association with those trees and the fungal community in the soils. On that second axis of the ordination, I can, if I look at various aspects of the soil properties, we find that the AMF communities vary in response to a range of interrelated soil factors, such as organic carbon, volumetric water content, pH, total nitrogen, and percent clay. But by far the best predictor of what defines the differences between a buscular mycorrhizal fungi communities in the absence of forest cover of different types of forest is the percent of sand how much sand is going to, we're going to see more different, we're going to see a greater turnover in communities depending on the proportion of sand. So finally, for our last two slides, um, I'm going to talk about the most recent work that's been done on microclimate. So there's some people in this audience like Miriam who've been studying microclimate for decades and it's now just back, come back into season particularly, I think, with concerns about warming climates and heat waves. And so what most of the work is really focusing on is the fact that we can really, that during a heat wave, we can really influence our small climate in our region by actually increasing shade and we absolutely do not want the sun to ever hit the ground <laughs> because when the sun hits the ground, it transfers so much heat to the ground. So all of the latest research on microclimate is saying canopy cover is going to be really crucial to provide resistance to thermal and drought from heat and drought in plantings. So early canopy cover is going to be really crucial. But now, once again, we have this trade-off. Um, we have various trade-offs. We have the trade-off of planting density, um, where in this case, we want to plant as dense as possible in order to get as much plant cover as possible to, re to reduce temperature and drought. Um, but we also want, we want rapid growth rates initially, but we don't want too rapid growth rates long-term because then that's going to affect how much root investment occurs. And I'm really curious about the whole syntropic farming process, particularly that it includes this idea of sacrificial plants. And I think that this could be really important for us to investigate. And that's the role of having these sacrificial plants that establish shade really early on, but then after we sacrifice them, they're contributing to um, organic matter in the soils. And so one of the questions that I think would come out of this is does planting density and subsequent thinning improve microclimate and soil health in restoration? So finally, um, natural recovery being inhibited by invasive grasses. So obviously one of the biggest limitations to forest recovery is competition. And this seems to be really a much more significant problem in Australia than what we're seeing in other parts of the world. So I'm part of a study which where we're finding abandoned pastures and we're finding past we're creating abandoned pastures in Australia, Mexico and Ghana. And what we're seeing in Mexico and Ghana is that within three years, these areas where they're excluding any agricultural activity are recovering really rapidly. But in Australia, we don't see this at all because we've got this wonderful um, invasive grasses and also probably that long legacy of land use in the region. So, but invasive grasses, of course, they inhibit recovery, they require resources to control, but with climate warming, um, they have a really important role where they can catalyze wildfires and convert forests to grasslands. And I think if you think about how important that is, 
Really, grasses are the exceptional ecosystem engineer where they can convert ecosystems, you know, completely change ecosystems. And when we talk about engineers, ecosystem engineers, I don't think we talk about invasive grasses enough in that role. So questions that I think would be really important for future research is will invasive grasses become more competitive under climate change? And if they are a limiting factor in recovery, what are the innovations that we can do in terms of moving forward to control them? And what do we do with restoration if we can't use Roundup? And if Roundup gets banned like it is in Canada and Europe, what are our options in Australia? So finally, if I get back to the beginning of the premise of tree was to have the right tree in the right place for the right reason. I would have to say that I think we need to have the right tree in the right place, but probably because it's our only option. And so now I invite Carly to come up and talk to you about her work. Um, so I'm now going to be speaking about um, how plant provenance impacts the responses of tropical trees to climate change. And to begin, I wanted to start getting to the very basics that temperature impacts leaf function. There are a lot of metabol processes in metabolism, including photosynthesis, respiration, that have temperature sensitivities. Um, and so if we take photosynthesis as an example, we see that it increases with temperature up to an optimum point. Um, and then declines after this quite rapidly once enzymes begin to denature. Um, and the typical sort of optimum temperature in the tropics is around 30, 33 degrees Celsius for tree species. And we find a critical temperature for where enzymes begin to lose their function around 46 degrees Celsius. And I've sort of got an image there of a plant that has been exposed to heat stress and is now browning. But what is important to understand is how these sort of sensitivities and tolerance values vary across individuals and indeed across species as well. And so if you imagine an elevation gradient where temperatures are cooler at high elevations and warmer at low elevations, we may get thermal specialists that have different optimum temperatures and have um, and consequently have different places or niches with, across that elevation gradient. But some species will be generalists that are found across a broad range of temperatures. And one question is, is the success of these species across a range of conditions due to their ability to acclimate? Or is there some population level adaptation where across the landscape you have different populations with their own thermal niches replacing each other? And so here we see one species, but different populations. And so diving into that idea of within species variation a bit more, um, we see that plants have a variety of, well, they, they vary in their morphology, growth, tolerance to stress, um, and this reflects their different strategies in response to their environment. So if we take something like leaf size, we may find a species has thicker um, or thinner, larger leaves in the lowlands and smaller, thicker leaves in the uplands. But what we may want to know is whether this is due to acclimation and adaptation, and we can um, start to look at that by looking at a common garden experiment where we get plants that were sourced originally from the uplands and those from the lowlands and plant them in a similar environment. So in this example, they may have been planted in a lowland site. And so you see the cool origin plant acclimates and has a similar leaf morphology to the lowland plant. Whereas in the other example to the right, the cool origin plant doesn't acclimate and there's a strong genetic control over that trait. This is all to say basically that within a species, populations can be adapted to their local environment. Why does this matter for rainforest restoration? Um, as Susan was mentioning, local climates are rapidly changing, making it difficult for some species to adapt, particularly long-lived um, species such as trees or organisms such as trees. Um, and this is because adaptation occurs over a long process. And yeah. Um, however, as we saw, populations can have different tolerances, different strategies across their environment. And so you may already have some populations that are adapted or have the adaptive capacity to help them survive in a warming world. So I'd like to introduce this idea of provenance, the geographic origin of seed, um, and how this applies to 
tree planting, often we will find a local provincing strategy where say you have a planting site um, represented by the star in this graph, you may source seed from local to that planting site to ensure you maintain the sort of genetic component of that site. Um, however, as the, since climate is warming, we expect the climate of that site to also increase in temperature or aridity. And we can then source seed from warmer climates within a species distribution to help aid restoration efforts considering temperatures are changing. And there are some variation in um, how you apply this. You can just take seed all from the one population or you can sort of mix it up a little bit. And so climate matching is then a nice strategy that could help improve restoration outcomes by using seed from populations already adapted to heat stress. But to implement these strategies, we need to understand things like how the climate of the site is going to change, the ability of species to acclimate and adapt, and the genetic history, things like the genetic structure or local adaptation that could um, complicate our use of this method. And so speaking on that first one um, about the current and future climate, um, there are already tools out there that allow you to sort of identify regions, um, for example, in the wet tropics that have a current um, climate similar to a planting location, um, as well as sites that may have, a, that, whose current climate is similar to what is predicted for that site. And so this is a quite a useful tool, both for this sort of climate matching provenance strategy, but also as a research tool to identify populations or sites to conduct research and test these um, hypotheses surrounding local adaptation and climate matching provenance. And so then I wanted to kind of introduce one of our projects that I'm a PhD working on with a large amount of people and partners. Um, and it's a project that aims to integrate climate adaptation into rainforest restoration plantings. And one part of this project is a common garden experiment that we've established where we're going to be looking at the growth of lowland and upland populations um, at three different sites. And so I'm gonna tell you about some of our preliminary results from that experiment. So we've been able to collect 16 species with the help of nurseries across the wet tropics. Um, and these species represent fast growth species, slow growth species. Um, yeah, and we've, if you look to the map, we've selected these from lowland and upland populations. And so each point represents a single seed source for a species with the blue points representing upland seed source and the red representing lowland seed source. Um, and you might be able to see if you are familiar with the area that most of these upland um, populations were sourced from the tablelands and the majority of the lowland was sourced from Cape Tribulation, Cow Bay area. Um, and so we have three sites and we've planted each population and each species at each site. And these are our sites. So we have Cape Tribulation, which is a lowland site at the Daintree Rainforest Observatory. It's got a flat topography and it, the site that we've done the tree planting at is recently cleared, but has quite intact soil with high nutrients. Um, our other two sites include Cow Bay, which was, is another lowland site, however, has a very different sort of soil characteristics where it was on an old airstrip and has very um, disturbed soils with a low water holding capacity. And then our third site is an upland site and it's at the slight, is on a slight slope at the base of a hill on the greater pasture land. And so across these sites, we planted um, our species in March, April last year. Um, and have been measuring growth and survival every six months. <clears throat> so what have we found? The main result, which we might have expected, is that the environment or the planting site was the main driver of growth variation. This isn't surprising. We know that plants vary across the environment. Um, however, 50% of the species were only impacted by the environment. There was no provenance level differences in how they responded. And so we can see the plant height, one year after the transplant, and this is an example for Melicope lariana, um, we see that growth was much higher at the DRO um, on the lowland, warm, wet, high nutrient site compared to the other two sites. And for all species that show, well, all species showed this environmental impact, but it was a similar um, trend for all where the DRO had the highest growth for every single species. Um, 
Some varied slightly, whether there were differences between the Cow Bay and the Yaki site, but for the majority, there were no differences between those two sites, which kind of shows that soil quality may be more limiting than temperature, which is quite interesting since we were trying to test temperature. <laughs> um, so looking at some of the other species responses, we found additive effects of environment and provenance. And so if we look here to Homolanthus, um, we see the environmental impact as we expect with growth higher at the DRO site, but we also see that the lowland um, provenance plants had a higher growth at every single site. And this was the same trend for all species. We found no sites where the upland um, provenance performed better. Um, and so this could help give us some support for using warm acclimated seed for lowland restoration, since there was no evidence for local adaptation of those table lamp populations. And we had two species that showed an interaction. Um, so they showed no differences in how their populations, no difference between their populations growth <coughs> at the Cow Bay and the Thiaki sites, but they did show um, difference at the DRO site. Um, these are ongoing measurements. We'll also be measuring things like the functional traits and thermal tolerance at these sites, as well as continuing to measure growth and survival um, as these plants grow and age. Um, and I guess one interesting thing to note from other studies is that sometimes it takes a while for local adaptation to um, be present or observed in these sort of experiments. And so this is something we'll have to continue to look at. Maybe um, a particular drought or heat stress event will um, happen at some point and we'll be able to see a difference in their growth strategies following that disturbance. Um, but in the meantime, what can we learn from experiments that are already established? Um, most synthesis studies that kind of look at local adaptation or home site advantage have um, a bias towards temperate, cooler climates. Um, there is very little research synthesized about tropical species. However, there is a lot of research done in these spaces in tropical species. So I've identified 57 studies that represent 74 species, the majority found in the neotropics. Um, and these represent common garden trials, reciprocal transplants, glasshouse experiments, where at least two or more populations were present within a species at a given test site. And these experiments sort of measured growth, survival, stress tolerance, leaf morphology, a range of traits, um, which can be useful um, for doing some meta-analysis. Um, but if we look, if we're interested in this question of do local populations perform better than non-local populations, only 38 of these studies included a local population, which allowed us to test um, these sort of hypotheses. And so what do we find? There's sort of mixed evidence for a home site advantage. Um, basically, all sort of, respond, all sort of results um, where the local population could perform better or worse or have no difference across the site were equally represented across these species. So it doesn't really help us um, predict what we might expect to find in, and apply that to rainforest restoration. However, with these data sets, we can begin to identify causal factors like what species traits might, um, what yeah, response may be more likely with a given species trait, such as a species being long lived, a particular dispersal strategy, or maybe population size. Um, what is the impact of the magnitude of the climatic difference between the seed source and the test site? And are there any biogeographical patterns? <laughs> I also just want to point out that most of these studies are done in Mertesi and Fabesi that are sort of economically important fast growing species for forestry. And so if we want to um, have more information that's relevant for rainforest species, we need to include um, provenance trials with these species. And so to end, I wanted to um, just summarize how provenance trials can aid our future research in rainforest restoration in a warming world. Um, and that Growing these um, species with the different genetic material at particular sites allows us to look at differences in species adaptation potential and how adaptation capacities may differ um, and acclimation, like the relative role of these two processes or drivers of variation. I also wanted to highlight that tropical rainforests are extremely diverse. We can't do these experiments on every single species. Um, and so we really need to identify traits or 
um, things that we can use to predict or categorize uh, these responses, the within species acclimation potential. Um, and I just want to finish by saying these um, experiments help us provide a, the scientific basis for assisted migration, which can yeah, help in the future. Thanks.